when Emmett Till, our beloved Bobo, was taken from us, taken to be tortured, brutally murder, murdered. Back then, when I was overwhelmed with terror and fear of certain death in the darkness of a thousand midnights, in a pitch black house on what some have called dark fear road. Back then in the darkness, I could never imagine a moment like this. Emmett Till would have been 82 years old today. His cousin, who you just saw speaking there, was with him in 1955 when they visited family in a town called Money, Mississippi. It was there that Emmett Till was murdered by two white men after a white woman accused the teenager of whistling at her. That is the unvarnished and recent history that President Biden commemorated today, honoring Emmett Till and his mother, Mamie Till Mobley, with a national monument. That monument is marked by three sites in Chicago, the church where Till's funeral was held, in Mississippi, the wooded area where his body was recovered, and the courthouse where his killers were wrongly acquitted. The monument stands in sharp contrast to the efforts that are underway in Florida and other Republican-led states to do the very opposite. Instead of looking honestly at American history, conservatives have launched a multi-pronged effort to whitewash it. Joining us now is someone who knows about Republican-led attacks on American history all too well, Nicole Hannah-Jones, creator of the 1619 Project and reporter for The New York Times Magazine. Nicole, thanks so much for making time for the show tonight. I, I got to ask you, as we look at this moment, you know, I'm reminded that when you came out with the 1619 Project, Trump comes out with the 1776 Commission. And I wonder how optimistic you are about the truth winning out, given the battle at hand. Um, I think that part of the reason we're seeing efforts like uh, Ron DeSantis and the Florida Board of Education to really whitewash the history and so many efforts happening legislatively across the country is because the truth had been winning out, that we did have, you know, large numbers of Americans for, who, for the first time, were getting a um, more honest version of American history. And so that's where this pushback is coming from, is the understanding that these truths were breaking through. Um, but I, I think it's hard to say that I'm optimistic because we we are seeing uh, people like Governor DeSantis and, um, you know, his appointees to the Board of Education, um, that they are being, they are successfully using the levers of the state to really try to proscribe our understanding of our history. Um, and we're not seeing, I think, enough efforts to combat that. Yeah, on that end, I guess I wonder what you think about monuments and how much they are an antidote to the whitewashing that's happened, the indoctrination, in fact, that's happening in school systems around the country. Do they matter in this fight? Monuments matter, of course. I mean, we, we memorialize things because we think they're important for us to know. And so whom we memorialize, how we memorialize, um, what uh, moments of our past that we choose to memorialize clearly matter because in public spaces, they tell us uh, what we value as a society and what story we want to tell ourselves about as a society. But I actually don't think most of us learn history that way. Um, what's happening in the classroom is much more important because most of us are understanding of American history, of global history, is being shaped in two places. It's being shaped in the classroom and it's being shaped in popular media. So I think what we're seeing um, in Florida and um, in other states, conservative states across the country, is far more critical to our historical understanding and kind of our collective memory of how we think about the United States and its history. And of course, the reason that matters is that shapes how we think about the United States right now. Yeah. Well, when you talk about collective memory, I mean, I, I was so struck, and I think all the people that work on the show, when we talk about Emmett Till, I think a lot of us contextualize that as, as something that happened a while ago. But Emmett Till would have been 82. You know, we have grandparents and some of us parents who are that old. His accuser just died in April. Do you think of the struggle of, of, the, of civil rights in the 1950s and 60s as a separate chapter from the civil rights struggle that's going on today? Or do you think of it as sort of one continuum? I'm, I'm, I'm eager to know how you sort of process these moments of national trauma and whether you delineate uh, sort of ADBC. 
So let's be clear. Um, my father was about the same age as Emmett Till. He was born in Greenwood, Mississippi. Emmett Till was killed uh, right outside of Greenwood in Money, Mississippi. Um, they were a few years apart. And just like Emmett Till, um, my father's uh, mother had migrated north and would send my father home to Mississippi in the summers um, to be with his grandparents. So this is not an ancient history. I'm 47 years old. A decade before I was born, Black people were being murdered all across the South, trying to fight for basic rights of citizenship, the right to vote, the right not to be racially segregated in apartheid schools and parks and libraries. Um, so of course, I see this as part of a continuing struggle. Um, that generation that did not have rights of citizenship in the country of their birth, they're still with us. I interview them often in the work that I'm doing. I feature them in the 1619 documentary series, and they're still fighting um, for us to maintain the rights of citizenship that we had. And so then you have, of course, this counter movement that's happening, uh, for instance, in a place like Florida, which is why we're talking about this tonight, um, that is really trying to uh, erase that history, trying to uh, whitewash it, trying to make it seem like that is um, unrelated to the society we have, that that's just part of a distant past, that it wasn't really uh, systematic. You know, I was, um, I spent some time looking at the new Florida the history standards, and I particularly looked at the way that they discuss the Holocaust compared to the way that they discuss uh, the Black American experience. They describe the Holocaust as a um, planned, systemic, and state-sponsored persecution and murder of Jewish people. They don't um, talk about other genocides that have happened uh, in the world when they talk about the Holocaust in Florida. They don't talk about how Jews may have gained some skills that they could use if they happened to survive the concentration camps. They don't talk about any of that. And they make it very clear that this was systematic and even have a chapter on the dangers of Holocaust denial. And then you compare the Black History Standards, which talk about slavery in Asia uh, during the ancient Samaria, um, that talk about the skills that enslaved people may have gained during slavery. And you see yeah. what it is that we're doing here, um, which is really trying to paint a picture of America, of a country that never existed. Um, and they do that in order to justify the inequality that we see in America today.